I'm Esme from the Keras System, and you're watching the Keras Collaborative. Hello! Okay, so assuming this video goes up, this will be the first video you're seeing from me, but it's not the first video I've done for you. What that means is my videos keep getting rejected because... insecurities. So hopefully this one goes through. We'll see. I decided to go for a bit of a safer topic for this one, but something that's still really personal to me. So what we're going to be talking about is the Borg F response. Um, so like the Borg fear slash trauma response, which is full on. Um, well, at least that's what I'm referring to. I don't know if that's usually classified as the fourth one, but I'm talking about full on um, because that's what that's the response that I kind of internalize, especially for our system. Not necessarily as a person, and I feel like I'm past that a lot, but um, definitely like the reason that I exist or the reason that I exist the way that I do is because I was made to be a people pleaser. Um, more like a person pleaser, but I'm going to avoid like getting into triggering topics um, and just like try and talk generically. So I feel like the reason that Vaughn is talked about a lot less than the other three, you know, um, fight, flight, freeze, than those three, is because Vaughn especially occurs in um, complex fear trauma situations, while the other three, you, see, you can see those like in your everyday, you know, fear response. The Vaughn response is especially common when you have a, uh, an interpersonal trauma going on. There's a siren, so I'm gonna wait a minute, I guess. Okay, it's finally on. So basically why Vaughn is considered to be more of a complex trauma response is because it's associated with traumatic codependent relationships that basically force that person to become, became, what, am I fucking Canadian? Force that person to become a people pleaser um, for you know whatever personal reason that might be for that specific trauma. We're basically taught that the price of admission to any relationship is to forfeit anything that's related to what we want, our possessions, our boundaries, you know, uh, the interactions that we like to see out of that relationship. To toss that all aside and instead value whatever it is that that person is demanding from us, and that. That's what we have to do in order to gain just basic love and respect as a human in this world. And it sort of becomes a script in how we interact with people on like a daily basis. For some people, not for everyone, but people that develop a fond response do so as a result of boundaries that are continuously violated. Relationships where we want more than anything to just be accepted. and. So we feel like lowering the boundaries and expectations that we have for our own treatment is what keeps us from getting hurt. And in reality, we're just putting ourselves in an abusive cycle or trying to normalize an abusive cycle that we have no choice of being in in the first place. And what's really harmful about that is that it, it becomes our standard, right? Even if we're able to escape the harmful relationship that put that idea into our head in the first place, we keep interacting like anything that we feel or need from other people is completely irrelevant because it's always them first. It's always their needs first. Our boundaries don't matter. You know, what we want out of the relationship is completely irrelevant because we were always used as an object instead of seen as a person. So like I said at the beginning, Vaughn is a large part of why I exist specifically the way that I do. Because I'm a part in our system that had to please others <laughs> to the point that I'd convince myself that others' wants and needs were actually my own. To the point that the only joy that I would get was in pleasing others. And if I wasn't able to do that, I just felt worthless. And I would give any, any part of myself to feed this need that I was made to believe was my own. Because convincing myself that I wanted what was happening and that it was somehow bringing me closer to my abuser created this false sense of safety, you know? Just to talk a little bit about how I feel Fawn impacted me, 
I think it really made me devalue myself as a person more than anything because I kind of just was made to see myself as worthless. Existing solely for others left no room for me to value myself. I definitely became a master at twisting the traumas that I was experiencing into not only things that I wanted, but things that I had caused. And while that convinced me in the moment that I was safe and that I had the control, what it ended up doing down the line is creating these deep feelings of shame and guilt about how I responded, feeling like I didn't do enough. For me, that's one of those moments where I really have to step aside. Even just looking at myself and kind of depersonalize for my own trauma, just because that's the only way that I can sympathize <laughs> is saying, that was a child. That was a child. That wasn't necessarily me. That was a child and that child did not deserve any pain that happened to them. And that's, that's just a fact. To me, that was at least the beginning of being able to accept that no matter what response I was made to have because of the specific grooming that I went through, I didn't deserve that. And I didn't bring that on myself. And I didn't deserve to be taken advantage of. And these are things I've had to teach myself. This isn't something that comes naturally by any means. <laughs> by any means. Like I said, like what comes naturally is that shame and guilt of just feeling like I did wrong and it's all my fault. And that guilt and having this response, especially paired together, and, and just continuing to have this response and having more guilt about having this response <laughs> leads to patterns of re-traumatization, at least in my experience, that I, I still steal. Why do I keep having this like Canadian twang? Is Bodhi Coke on? Oh my God that I still deal with to this day. Like I still put myself in harmful situations that in the end, they're not, they're not to reclaim my body. They're not to reclaim my experiences or to reclaim my sexuality. They're to self-harm. And I know that. But at least in the moment, I'm able to convince myself that that's not the case. I'm able to say, this is healthy. This is for me. This is benefiting me in some way, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it and I have done a lot of progress. And I'm not gonna leave this video without talking about some of the things that I've done and how it's helped me. And hopefully maybe can help some of you guys that might be dealing with developing a fond response. Not only, you know, while in a traumatizing situation, but also while coming out of it and navigating living life afterwards. And again, all of these are personal. They're not, you know, medical or psychiatric. We're not a professional. This is just what works for me and our system and may work for you or may not. So the first thing we'll always recommend in basically any healing um, from interpersonal traumas at least is developing healthier relationships and bonds that show you what respectful boundaries are supposed to look like. They show you what it looks like to be loved and respected as a person, like you actually deserve. That's the kind of thing that's going to reform the kind of responses that you naturally have with other people. You have to show yourself better. And you don't necessarily need other people to do that. You can do that through just loving yourself, but for a lot of people, that's a lot harder. My next step would be practice saying no, even just small things that you don't want to do. Never force yourself into any situation that doesn't match your own wants and desires or that isn't a complete necessity for your well-being. Life is too short for you to be wasting your day giving so much of yourself that it subtracts from your own well-being just to benefit other people. You're lovable on the basis of you exist, not because you do anything for anyone. It's okay to be selfish. Start telling yourself this, affirm it in your mind every day that you're allowed to value yourself and take time for yourself and that you should daily. Next thing I'd recommend is figuring out what your boundaries are and writing them down. 
and taking the steps to implement them and teach them to yourself and to others around you. And don't slip up on them. These are your boundaries. You have every right to put them in place in every aspect of your relationships, no matter what. You have a right to live your life the way that you want to. Healing after this kind of interpersonal trauma, after someone takes something away from you, is about regaining that sense of control in any way that you can in your own healing and, and how you interact with people from then on out. So you get to pick, right? You get to pick who's in your life, how they're in your life, what they get to do to you, how they get to talk to you, and how they behave around you. And if you don't like it, if you don't like that person and how they're acting, you have every right to remove them. Your boundaries matter. You're entitled to your own time and to your own body. This is your life. Stop trying to use others to prove your worth to yourself. You don't have to tame the beast to be worthy of love. Start by loving yourself. You are the most fundamentally opposed to having that level of compassion for you. You can't prove you're lovable to yourself by spending yourself on abusers, but you can by breaking that inevitable opposition that you have towards yourself. So, I'm a lot of iced coffee, and I'm pretty sure that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, leave your comments, and next time I'm out, I'll be sure to read them. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for watching.